us pray. God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world around us. And open our lives to the infinite possibilities born of your love. Amen. I'm a fan of the writings of Leo Tolstoy, and in 1885, he published a short story that is actually a very moving one that's called The Three Questions. In that story, we are introduced to a king, obviously a rather wise man, who sits and considers one day that if he could come up with the answers to three questions, that he would be able to be successful in about any venture that he pursued in life. And those three questions were, what action should I take? When should I take it? And with whom should I be? So he called upon the wisest people in his kingdom to come and offer him answers to those three questions, and he knew right away that that had probably been a mistake because the wise people that he'd called together all had different answers to his question. So he decided that he was going to go and pay a visit to a person who was deemed one of the wisest people in his kingdom, a hermit who lived a long way away. He made the long trek to the hermit's house, and when he found the hermit, the hermit was outside digging as if to prepare a garden. And the king posed the three questions to the hermit, and the hermit said nothing, and he continued to dig. And after a while, the king was watching the hermit dig, and he was a a rather frail man. And he continued to watch him dig. And after a time, he thought perhaps if he helped him dig, that the hermit might be inclined to give him an answer to his three questions. And so the king took the shovel from the hermit and began to do the hermit's digging. (coughs) Time passed and the king was still digging and digging and digging and the hermit had not said a thing. And he said, I was hoping that you would answer my questions. You are wise, and I need you to answer my questions. And the hermit said nothing. And just about that time, a man stumbled out of the woods, and he had been injured. It was clear that he had been injured. He was bleeding. He stumbled out of the woods, and the king and the hermit both walked over to him. And the king, seeing the extent of his injuries, rushed to get water and something to bind his wounds, and they took him back into the hermit's house. And by now, it's almost nightfall. So the king and the hermit and the injured man all end up spending the night at the hermit's home. When morning comes, the injured man looks at the king and says, please forgive me. And the king is completely perplexed, and he says, I've never seen you before. I can't imagine that I would have any reason to need to forgive you. And the injured man said, yes, I do need you to forgive me. You see, king, you executed my brother. And yesterday, when I saw you making your way to the hermit's house, I decided that I would lie in wait for you so that I might take your life for the life that you had taken from me. But while I was waiting, I was injured myself. And you, king, chose save me. And so now I have to ask your forgiveness. 
king didn't quite know what to say, so he went looking for the hermit who was outside spreading seed where they had been digging the day before. And he looked at the hermit and he said, you have still not answered me. I need the answers to my three questions. I need to know what is the most important thing for me to do, when is the right time for me to do it, and who are the right people to be with me when I'm doing it. I need to know the answers. And the hermit shook his head and said, but you already have the answers. The right time is always right now. It is in the moment, because yesterday when you came, in the moment that you decided to stay and help me, you saved your life. And the right person is the person with whom you are present at that very moment. Because it was me that you stayed to help, and I was the right person for you to help in that moment. And the right thing to do was to always do good, because the fact that you stayed and you did good by me meant that you did not leave and lose your life. And so the hermit says to him, the right time is always right now, the right person is always the person with whom you are right now present. And the right thing to do is always to do good. The king had clearly been so busy looking for a big answer, a hard answer some obscure answer to his questions. And the obvious answer that had been right in front of him had eluded him. I want you to process that for just a moment while we talk about Paul's letter to the Christians at Corinth. What we know historically about the folks in Corinth was that this was a divided group of folks. Now, there's something to be said about the rich fabric of diversity that makes us wonderful because we come to any community with all of the great treasures that we bring in our traditions and in our backgrounds and in all of the things that we embrace. And all those things can make for a wonderful, wonderful tapestry in any community. But they can also lead to division, and this is what was going on in Corinth. It was division. Folks were fighting over which traditions should survive and who should do what, and I'm better than you, come on. And there was much division and fighting. And so this is the community into which Paul is writing a community of folks who are divided and bitter and bickering and quarreling and angry. And what Paul is admonishing to them is that you need to be reconciled to God and to one another because if you do that, then all this other stuff goes away. And Paul reminds them, see, now is the acceptable time. Now is the moment. Now is what we are here for, is to be reconciled with God and with one another. Paul has already walked the hard road. He tells them about all of the persecution that he's already known for the name of Christ. But he calls them to a very different kind of existence to live in kindness and genuine love and truth-telling, to live in harmony with one another. 
And this is going to be a stretch for the folks at Corinth because they haven't quite figured out how to take that wonderful tapestry of all of the things that they bring to their community and to truly be one in Christ. And so this is what Paul is trying to call them to see. All of these great gifts that you bring, all of these great gifts that you bring, give you the opportunity to be one in Christ and to celebrate all that you have. Which can sound like a daunting proposition when we're trying to decide whose traditions survive and whose do not, whose way is the right way, and whose way is not. It's a daunting proposition to tell ourselves that what we are called to do indeed is to be one in Christ. Lent gives us a unique and special opportunity to look inside ourselves for these 40 days, to ask ourselves what God is calling us to do and be, and to live into that prayerfully. And so tonight, we sit edge of this Lenten journey, hearing the words of Tolstoy ringing through our heads too. The right time is right now. We can take away all of our excuses for delaying one more day, one more hour, one more whatever. The right time right now. And the right person, that right person is the brother or sister who's standing right in front of us. That is our right person with whom we reconcile and do good. And the right thing to do always is to do good by that brother or sister who's standing right there. Because that, that, that is the purpose to which we are called. these 40 days, may we all be prayerful about the purpose to which we are called. May we all be prayerful about taking that right step right now to do good for everyone that we encounter in God's world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.